We thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, join together and network tonight, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's uh, through uh, the YouTube channel. Lord, we are living in some crazy times. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic now only compa uh, compounded by the civil unrest that's going on in our country and in many cities uh, across the world, across the nation, and uh, just, just everything, the chaos that's going on. But we know, Lord, that as you are watching this stuff, that while it may be new to us, it's nothing new to you because you've been dealing with chaos like this and confusion and anarchy ever since um, Lucifer rebelled against you in heaven. And so, Lord, we just want to trust you tonight. We do want to face the future, not with fear, but with great faith and hope uh, that uh, these trials and troubles that we find ourselves in um, are indicators that you're coming as soon. So just keep us in your care. Open our minds to your word tonight, and may we be drawn closer to you. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you uh, for joining us, and I want to introduce our special guest, uh, Alan Reinick. Uh, Alan is uh, an attorney, Hi. and he is uh, uh, our guest presenter tonight. He is the executive director of the Church State Council, uh, and he is in, involved in uh, helping people uh, uh, face uh, uh, as they deal with uh, various uh, religious liberty issues. And he has, from his perspective as a minister and also as an attorney, uh, has a, uh, a rather interesting perspective on some of the prophecies of the book of Revelation. And we look forward to hearing uh, what uh, will be presented us tonight and again on Tuesday and Thursday night of this week, and then next Sunday and Tuesday night in this five-night series. So we're just delighted that you are here with us. And Alan, it's great to have you. And... Uh, uh, we uh, are, I don't know, do you want to talk to them now at all about the, the resources or will those resources be at the end? Well, no, I'd be happy to just uh, kind of give a, a brief on, on what we're going to do as far as resources. We're going to be covering a lot of scriptures. So one thing we figured to do is simply give you the PowerPoint slide pack available on, uh, we'll give out at the end. Uh, where you can find that online. So, you know, if you're chilling and you don't want to have to take a lot of notes tonight, uh, I mean, it, it might be helpful, but you'll be able to get all of the PowerPoint slides. You mentioned about doing Q&A. Um, what we're going to do with that is every night at the beginning, uh, if you submit questions or comments in writing, which you can also do at that same location. Uh, or if you want, find me on Facebook and, and send me some questions on, or, or comments. We'll take a few minutes at the start to address some questions and then get into the presentation. But uh, tonight, it's just the presentation. Well, great. Uh, thank you so much, Alan. And I'm going to turn the time over to you now. Okay. So uh, if you can go ahead and start with our first slide, our title slide. Tonight's presentation is entitled Apocalypse Soon. Apocalypse. The very word strikes either fear or excitement. It's a word bandied about a lot these days, given the worldwide pandemic. That's enough of the slide. I, we, we can just switch it back and forth, Bill, if you would, back to me. The United States has passed a milestone, kind of a, a tragic one. 100,000 or more dead from the pandemic, and it appears the body counts may even be too low, that some of the deaths where people have died of pneumonia or heart attacks or, or something else uh, have, have really been COVID-19 deaths, but haven't been counted that way. When we fought a war in Iraq, we would see body bags on television. We had something visual to connect to, to the tragedy of war, to the tragedy of, of loss. We don't know how to wrap our brains around these statistics. All we have really are our imaginations. Now, I feel like I need to start with a disclaimer because, you know, the title of the series, Coming Economic Collapse, you know, it, it can bring out the worst sort of conspiracy tendencies thoughts of the one world order or the Illuminati or, 
or whatever the latest conspiracy craze is like uh, QAnon. But frankly, that's not my style. I'm, I'm more Joe Friday. I'm an attorney. I just want to get the facts. I'm not interested in speculation. I'm not interested in hidden knowledge. Uh, the book of Revelation says it's a re revelation of Jesus Christ. And I want to see uh, what it has to, to show us that's useful for us today. So we're going to do a deep dive into that book. And, you know, it may be in the popular imagination that it's a book full of secrets and mysteries. Uh, the very title contradicts that. It really is the revelation of Jesus. It's, it's not about hiding anything. So the current economic distress will be the launch point for, <clears throat> for a dive into the scriptures. But uh, because after all, the Bible does speak of an economic collapse. And that's what we're going to take a look at, first of all, tonight. But the truth, I think, is, is far more important than anything you're going to find in a conspiracy theory. So here goes. Let's go to the next slide. I'm the first in three generations of Wall Street. Uh, I'm sorry, the first of three generations of Rhinox to leave Wall Street. My grandfather, Udo Rhinox, started a brokerage firm with his friend Ira Hauck. He boarded a ship for Europe in the summer of 1929 because he saw the stock market crash coming and he didn't want to be around for the bloodbath. People were literally jumping out of windows. My dad, Anthony Reinach, was a commodities trader, wrote a best-selling book about it. Uh, here's a picture of it, The Fastest Game in Town. After college, my brother went to Wall Street. He bought a seat on the New York Futures Exchange, which was located in one of the low buildings in the World Trade Center. Thankfully, he was not on the trading floor on September 11, 2001. I chose law school. I was one of those lost souls of the 70s generation, searching for meaning and purpose and God in all the wrong places. And as a Jewish kid from New York, you can imagine I was shocked when God revealed to me that my Messiah was Jesus. Growing up, everything I learned about Jesus, I think, pretty much I learned from the Doobie Brothers. Uh, you remember the song, Jesus is just all right with me. Well, almost everything, because the Jesus I knew about growing up, well, he had long shoulder length flowing hair, he wore white robes and sandals. So I knew he was a hippie, he was one of us. After joining the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I realized I was a member of not one, but two religious minorities and quickly grasped, grasped why both Adventists and Jews have deep historic commitments to religious freedom. So I went to law school and uh, devoted my professional career to representing workers suffering harassment and discrimination because of religion. My first job after law school, I worked in a legal services office in Brooklyn. Uh, it was an office doing landlord tenant work for the Jewish poor. My very first day on the job, I'll never forget, we screened a case for a family who'd been illegally locked out of their apartment, literally with just the clothes on their backs. On the way home that night, I walked past the appliance sector. I'm sorry, past the appliance store and noticed the television screens turned to the stock market ticker tape. I saw a lot of red. And so I looked much more closely. It was October 19. 1987. The Dow Jones Industrial Average had plunged 500 points, a day that became known as Black Monday. 500 points was a big deal when the Dow was only 2,300. The equivalent today would be uh, a 5,000 point drop in one day. Well, my legal career had begun with a, quite literally a stock market crash, but I couldn't help thinking about my new clients who were on the street with nothing and the contrast between them and those who had taken a proverbial bath in the stock market. Economic stability is an illusion. Our generation has enjoyed so much prosperity, we take it for granted. 
but there have always been bubbles and crashes. In the 17th century, there was the famous tulip craze in Holland. The price of tulips became so absurd that in 1624, you could buy a house for two tulips. But what goes up must come down. And in 1638, the tulip market came crashing down. And every century since has seen its bubbles and crashes. The crashes of 1929, 1987, and 2008 are just the ones in our uh, recent memory. In the 1920s, <clears throat> the stock market bubble was fueled by too much risk and too much leverage. You could buy $100 worth of stock for $10. Bill, could you uh, go to the next slide, please? You could make lots of money if the market went up, but Main Street tends to buy at the top and sell at the bottom. When the market started going down, those who bought at or near the top were wiped out, causing the market to fall even faster. In the first decade of this century, we had a real estate bubble fueled by, again, too much risk and too much leverage. I just love this, this uh, uh, cartoon here, it's uh, funny. Banks loaned out too much money to people who could not afford to pay those loans in order to generate fees. Then they sliced and diced those loans into pieces called tranches and bundled those tranches until they were unrecognizable. Sold them as investment grade securities, generating huge profits. A few very smart investors figured out what was wrong and bet against the housing market. Their story is told in Michael Lewis's best-selling book, The Big Short, and in a movie by the same name. Well, the last recession was really quite uh, enormous. It practically wiped out the middle class. And yet here we all are. The global economy recovered, kept chugging along. Everyone who wanted to work could eventually work, although the quality of jobs was eroded, the gig economy kicked in and more Americans were, quote, self-employed without paid vacation, without employer provided medical insurance or retirement plans. My Uber driver in San Jose last fall was an out of work engineer. He told me I had to work 12 hour days just to clear minimum wage after expenses. While the middle class is limping along, we might ask, where has all the money gone? In my youth, <clears throat> the anti-war song asked, where have all the flowers gone? Now it's, where has all the money gone? Gone to one percenters, every one. Not only are the biggest banks holding all the assets, but, uh, and it's not just to uh, one percenters uh, generally, this is an amazing statistic on the next slide. Uh, when you hear about wealth inequality, it is staggering. Three men have more wealth than half of the entire nation. And many of us literally have nothing. You know, we're living hand to mouth uh, and, uh, you know, uh, paycheck to paycheck, right? Well, it's been four years since I last presented this series. And on the next slide, you'll see what I identified as global risk factors four years ago. Now, apparently Bill Gates understood and, and some others understood the risk of a virus of a pandemic. I certainly wasn't on my radar screen. Uh, the latest threat to the global economy, it's, it's not speculative, it's our present reality. We're seeing unemployment at Great Depression levels, 40 million Americans out of work, economic contraction we haven't seen in our lifetimes. And the pandemic has yet to reach its full potential for mischief. Globally, and we don't often think in these terms, 3 billion people lack adequate access to water for washing and hygiene. Even lining up to get water risks spreading COVID-19. 50 million people died in the Spanish flu 100 years ago. 
And COVID-19 surely has the potential to kill just as many or more. Don't kid yourselves, folks. It ain't over till it's over. So my title this evening, next slide, is Apocalypse Soon? Question mark. Because after all, uh, I used to say they didn't give me a crystal ball when I graduated law school. Now I like to say that Lucas, my dog, broke it. <clears throat> well, let's go to our next slide then. Okay. Given the severity of the pandemic, it's no wonder that many are wondering whether we really are in the midst of some kind of apocalypse. But I'm sorry to say, I can't really predict what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year. All we can do is present what the Bible says. So the short answer to the question, is there a coming economic collapse, is yes. That's the bad news. We'll get the bad news out of the way. But hold on, because good news is coming. After all, the subtitle to the series says, face the future with faith, not fear. Well, the Bible standard of proof is by the mouth of two or three witnesses will a thing be established, Deuteronomy 19.15. So we're going to take a look at two witnesses tonight. And our first is found in a letter written by James. Wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you. Eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. The wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Well, observe first that this passage is a condemnation of the rich in, quote, in the last days. Well, the last days refers to the time before the second coming. Now, in verse 7, which uh, we did not put up on the slide, James encourages us to be patient, quote, until the Lord's coming. So he's clearly writing about the destruction of wealth before the return of Christ. So what does the text say happens to the gold and silver? It rusts. Rusted gold and silver are worthless. You get the picture? Rot, mothy, rusted. In a series of three, James emphatically describes the condition of the wealth of those whose wealth has been gained on the backs of oppression and fraud against the working class. The Bible is full of sequences of three, and we're going to see more of them as we go along. If two is emphatic, a sequence of three is doubly or triply emphatic. Well, the message is clear. The destruction of wealth is sure. Now, what does the text say about why judgment falls upon the wealthy? It says it's due to fraud and oppression of labor, workers not being paid, harvesters crying out for justice, and God hears their cries. So we have a picture here coming up of a sweatshop, a garment factory in Southeast Asia. James's prophecy is being fulfilled in our own day. Corporations rake in obscene profits by moving production to, con to countries where they don't have to pay workers enough even to be able to feed their families. And, and, and Americans don't realize just how bad it is. In parts of Southeast Asia, women and children are sold into the sex trade for as little as a box of dried noodles. Americans think we abolished slavery 150 years ago, but there are more slaves in America today than ever before. Human trafficking has become an epidemic problem, especially in the sex and drug trades. Factories around the world employ children in virtual slave labor conditions, but it's not just children. In China, religious believers are sent to labor camps and made to produce goods without being paid. They're prisoners of conscience. I did an interview recently with a, um, a Chinese human rights activist on my radio show, Freedom's Ring. It's, it's very moving. 
consumer spending accounts for 70% of our nation's economy. But it's an economy built on the few becoming uh, filthy rich while not paying workers a fair wage. 2000 years ago, James wrote that God heard the cries of the workers and that judgment will come. James nailed it. But this is not so much judgment on individuals as it is on institutions, on our whole global economic order, because that's what's soon to come under judgment. Well, James is our first witness of a coming ec economic collapse. Our second witness requires a bit of interpretation because it involves the use of symbols, in particular, the symbol of mystical Babylon. Now, you may or may not be disappointed because in this series, I'm not gonna make any effort to try to figure out who the symbols represent. I'm much less interested in who and identifying uh, you know, various powers and entities as the significance of these symbols, the significance of, of why we're given this information. Well, okay, so we'll start here. Revelation 18, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen and has become a dwelling place for demons, a prison for every foul spirit in the cage, for every unclean and hated bird. So the symbol of Babylon requires a little bit of interpretation. Let's go to the next slide. For all nations have drunk from the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Notice that Babylon's influence is global. All nations are said to have entered an illicit relationship with her. And here we see a counterfeit trinity. You've got Babylon, you've got the nations and king or kings, and you have the merchants. So what is it that Babylon is a symbol of? Well, the text gives us a very important clue because Babylon here is distinct from both the political and economic powers. Babylon is not the nations. It's not the kings or the merchants. The kings and the merchants are said to be in bed with her. Well, we're gonna go next to Revelation 17 because this picks up the theme of, uh, of Babylon. And in fact, we're gonna be working our way backwards in the book of Revelation during this series. I, 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 to me, it makes sense working backwards, but you'll, you'll see how that works as we go along. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and, and spoke with me saying, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Let's go to the next slide, I think, 19 and 20, next two slides. Then he carried me away in spirit into the desert. There I saw a woman riding upon a scarlet animal covered with blasphemous titles and having seven heads and 10 horns. The woman herself was dressed in purple and scarlet, glittering with gold, jewels, and pearls. In her hand, she held a golden cup full of the earth's filthiness and her own foul impurity. On her forehead is written a name with a secret meaning, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of the earth's abominations. Then I noticed that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs for Jesus. Well, Revelation 17 picks up the theme of judgment that we saw in James. Babylon is symbolized as a harlot, a prostitute, an immoral woman. And here too, uh, the same immoral intimate relationship, uh, Babylon, we saw in Revelation 18, 
uh, she is here, she's said to have with whom? With the kings of the earth. Babylon is also said to be the mother of all harlots and the mother of the earth's abomination. In fact, that's her name. That's who she is. It's not just a description of her character, it's her, whoever she is. So we've got a picture, an artist's rendition of the harlot Babylon here, riding on the beast with the seven heads and the 10 horns. So why is this woman given the name Babylon? Well, to answer this, we've got to go back to some history. Babylon was an ancient city home to some of the seven wonders of the ancient world, including what's pictured here, the famous hanging gardens. It doesn't look like a picture of famous hanging gardens, but that's the best I could come up with. <clears throat> In the Bible, Babylon is notable for conquering Jerusalem. In the culture of the ancient Near East, this victory proved the supremacy of the Babylonian gods over the God of the Jews. Daniel is the Old Testament companion to the book of Revelation in the New Testament. These two books are called apocalyptic literature of the Bible. Now, these apocalyptic books did not primarily speak to present conditions, but to global issues, to the rise and fall of nations and of God's plan for dealing with evil in the world, the establishment of God's kingdom, the role of the Messiah, Jesus and his return. Of course, the term apocalypse has a common meaning applying to, quote, an event involving destruction or damage on an awesome or catastrophic scale, although it can also mean a world-ending event. In the Bible, the two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem, become symbols of the cosmic battle between good and evil, light and darkness, God and Satan. Babylon. The very name means confusion, while Jerusalem, by contrast, means a city of peace, shalom. Now, the key to deciphering the meaning of Babylon is to understand what a woman represents in the Bible. Babylon is a woman, an immoral one. In Revelation 12, uh, we see a different sort of woman, a pure woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. There's so much symbolism uh, that it's very easy to get confused. So as we go through this, I'm only going to focus on those symbols that we need to get to, uh, need to get to where we're going in the presentation. <coughs> There's literally a lifetime worth of study in these passages. Uh, let's go to the next. Okay, so then the Bible says another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Well, we just saw a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Now it's called a dragon. And on his head, seven diadems. His tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. <coughs> the man child, she gave birth to a, man, to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Well, the man child is a symbol of Jesus. Uh, the passage, the, the phrase will rule all nations with a rod of iron is a dead giveaway. It's an Old Testament quote. And we all know the story about how when the wise men came to Herod in search of the baby Messiah, Herod wanted them to report back. And when the wise men did not report, they were warned not to go back to Herod. Herod slaughtered all the male children uh, under the age of two years old. Now, John wrote the book of Revelation decades later. So this reference is not a prophecy, but it's, it's history by this point. 
The dragon with the seven heads and 10 horns uh, represented the Roman Empire uh, that, you know, Herod was obviously part of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> and throughout the apocalyptic prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, a beast represents a nation or a kingdom. Let's go to our next slide here. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So this passage shows us a, you know, a cosmic battle uh, even before uh, the events of uh, Revelation 12, even before the uh, attempt to kill the baby Jesus, to, to kill the Messiah, and it identifies the dragon as Satan himself. So the dragon has a dual application here because it represented the nation or the kingdom of Rome, the empire, the Roman Empire, that the devil worked through in his warfare against uh, the Messiah, but it also has uh, a meaning and application to the devil himself, to Satan himself. <clears throat> well, I said earlier that there is good news coming. And so here it is. In the end, God wins. It's that simple. Jerusalem, the city of peace, the kingdom of peace, prevails over Babylon, the city of confusion. Uh, light dispels darkness, truth dispels error, and good will in the end triumph over evil. Okay, next slide. So now we can go back to Revelation 17, and we see a woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of Jesus. And, and John marvels at this. Well, in chapter 12, we saw the woman clothed with the sun standing on the moon represented the, the Jewish people, the community of faith that gave birth to the Messiah. Jesus was a Jew. God chose Israel to preserve the knowledge of the creator God, to give Messiah to the world. And the Jews have done that, certainly, and, and much more. In chapter 17, a woman is riding on the dragon beast. To be on top is the position of power. So this woman is in a power relationship with the kingdoms, with the empires of the world. And she's the mother of the abominations of the world, devoted to killing the devout followers of Jesus. So the woman Babylon represents also a community of faith. But since she is the mother of like-minded harlots and abominations, the corruption is not limited to a single religious institution. It has infected the world's religions with its corruption. Or more to the point, at the time Babylon comes under judgment, it will have successfully infected the religions, the nations, even the business community with its corruption. So now we can return to our second witness to global economic collapse. And we can understand what we're reading about. <clears throat> Babylon representing corrupt religious institutions is in bed with the political and economic establishment. Religion provides moral legitimacy to a corrupt global economic order. And we're gonna talk more about that as we go along. But we can read the description here of economic collapse. And I think it, it will now make sense to us. And a lot of this is not symbolism at all. So let's go through the next series of slides. And let's just read the collapse. Next slide, please. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance, 
for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore, merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense, wine, and oil, fine flour, and wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and bodies, and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud, alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men Sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour, she has been laid waste. And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. And all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all who have been slain on the earth. It's a very profound passage to read out loud. It's, it, it always moves me when I do. Well, the Bible uses repetition for emphasis. And what, what we read was repeated over and over. Babylon laid waste, repeated three times. Babylon's fall is sudden and unexpected, taking place in one hour, also repeated three times. And then as the passage leaves the narrative form and becomes poetry, the expression no more is repeated six times. Nothing of economic life and the global economic order as we know it will remain standing. Civilization as we know it is annihilated. There's an old joke about the difference between a recession and a depression. You know what the difference is? A recession is when your neighbor loses his job. And a depression, 
uh, I think you know where this is going. Uh, a depression is when you lose your job. Well, Revelation 18 describes a time when there are no more jobs. There's no more economy, no more factories, no more commercials. The wheels of commerce have literally spun out of control and gone completely flat. So there really is an economic collapse coming and it's far worse than anything we've ever seen or we could even imagine. But there is something, a final point that, that we should observe from this passage. And it's in that last slide we were looking at. <clears throat> now this text suggests that our mundane daily life might benefit from a bit of a spiritual tuna. Because, you know, as, as most of us see it, I think, a world without Target and Home Depot, without Trader Joe's and Costco, well, that would kind of be a catastrophe. But here the Bible says it's cause for rejoicing. All heaven will rejoice when Babylon finally gets its due. The corrupt, oppressive, economic, political, and religious institutions that run our civilization, they come under judgment, and it will be a cause for rejoicing. Babylon gets what she deserves. Corporations that have oppressed workers crash. Big pharma selling drugs for thousands of dollars, creating an opioid epidemic and killing thousands, crash. Insurance companies denying medical treatment to sick people, crash. Politicians in the pockets of business interests, crash. Clergy who preach about God but abuse children, double crash. In one hour, Babylon is found no more. It's judgment day. I kind of like that ticking sound. That's kind of appropriate here. Now it's true that the apocalypse, judgment day, these can be scary concepts, but they don't have to frighten you. The entire point of the apocalypse is that God will one day set things right. There will be an accounting for the mess that we've made of this world. But the book of Daniel has a judgment scene where judgment is rendered for us, not against us. The verdict is in our favor. As the series continues, we're gonna see more about how God will set things right. What we've seen tonight is that God does sit in judgment on civilization, on Babylon. And when God executes judgment, Babylon falls and chaos erupts. The economy disappears. The corrupt political, economic, and religious institutions of the world come under judgment. Now, what grave evil do you suppose will deserve such a judgment? That's a key question that we're going to take up as the series continues. After all, if you think about it, the 20th century saw mass murder on an unimaginable scale. Mass starvation. I could go on and on, the, the Holocaust. But my point is this. If God did not see fit to intervene and execute judgment for the evils of the 20th century, what will the future bring that will finally bring God uh, to execute judgment? Well, our next presentation is on Tuesday evening. Tuesday, we're going to take a look at the apocalyptic sermon of Jesus. And we're going to see what Jesus said about the end times in a topic that I've entitled a COVID collapse question mark. And then we do a two part presentation, the crisis before the collapse. Now, we don't know when our civilization will come under judgment, but we can glean some insight into the crisis that causes the global economy to implode. And finally, while we cannot say whether all of this is even going to occur during our own lifetimes, uh, we're going to conclude with a topic, shelter from the storm. We want to know what the Bible says about how we can find shelter, how we can find peace and security, even if everything goes completely haywire around us. When the time comes, 
if it does come in our lifetimes, we will need shelter. So spoiler alert, our shelter is not gonna be found in stockpiling guns or food and building a remote retreat off the grid. I'm not saying you should or should not do any of those things, but what we're gonna be talking about is a spiritual shelter that we need, a retreat from anxiety and fear where we can have peace in the midst of external turmoil. So we've got four more presentations. And <clears throat> as we said, there is, uh, if we go to our, our last slide, let's give out that address for uh, where to find the resource page. Uh, one more, there we go. So it's at bit.ly, bit.ly, bit and it's simply forward slash coming economic collapse. So it's bit, bit.ly, forward slash coming economic collapse. And, um, you know, we did advertise this some, if, especially if you're, if, if you're tuning in from afar, love to know how far and wide this might have gone, uh, you know, where folks are, are watching or listening from. Um, again, there's a place there to ask questions, to make comments. Uh, by all means, we solicit your prayers. These are some very serious topics, and uh, we certainly do pray for, for God's wisdom and blessing as, as we work our, uh, work our way through these scriptures. Uh, and again, we will address Time permitting, we'll address some of the questions and comments at the beginning of each of the next sessions. Well, that's it for tonight. I want to thank everyone for joining us, uh, and may God bless you and keep you safe. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Would you uh, let's have a closing prayer? Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. And uh, again, just to uh, remind everyone, uh, the title of your presentation. Uh, on Tuesday night was again what? So Tuesday night is a COVID collapse. And we're going to look at the apocalyptic uh, sermon of Jesus found in Matthew 24 and 25. Okay, great. Well, we will look forward to that. Let's have a closing prayer here together. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have had to uh, take a look at your word tonight. And uh, we are just um, grateful that we have this opportunity to, to look at scripture and to uh, delve into it. Lord, we recognize that uh, there are many people that would use this to invoke fear, but it's not our purpose to find fear. It's our purpose to find hope, to uh, knowing that these trying times are going to come to find refuge in, in Jesus as our friend and savior. So we thank you for that assurance that we have. And may we continue to find hope as we find answers from your word. May your blessing be upon each of us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Phil, you're muted now. We look forward to seeing you back here on Tuesday evening. We thank you for joining us. And uh, we will be back here at 730 on Tuesday evening. Uh, if you join us by Zoom, it will be the same link that you joined us with tonight. If you joined by YouTube, uh, it will be the same YouTube channel that you joined us with tonight. Uh, don't hesitate to invite your friends to share this with family and friends and neighbors. And uh, join us on Tuesday evening. We will look forward to that. Until then, good night and God bless.